We want to take you straight to Washington, D.C., where President Biden is about to sign the bipartisan infrastructure bill into law, more than $1 trillion. Let's listen in. Okay, here we go. On November 15th, 2021, President Biden signed the bipartisan infrastructure law, which included America's largest investment in public transit ever. Between that and other federal money from fiscal year 2022 through 2026, the U.S. government is expected to spend between 91 and $108 billion on local public transit. But I believe that, that with the money coming in from infrastructure, uh, it's going to actually help us rebuild American transit. With that much money at stake, using it effectively will be key. After all, the impact is expected to be enormous. From connecting people to jobs and economic opportunities to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, city congestion, and accidents. Data also support the idea that the prosperity of a major city like New York or Boston is closely tied to the strength of its subway system. According to some estimates, economic gains could equal about 10% of GDP. But building infrastructure in the U.S., and in this case, subways, is very expensive. In fact, it is the sixth most expensive place to build rail transit in the world. And even that is likely an understatement. So what is it that makes building subway infrastructure so expensive in the U.S.? And can anything be done about it? When you think about the complexity of the system, what's going on above the street, what's going on below the street, there's really nothing to compare it to in the world. This is Carmen Bianco. He was the vice president of subways at MTA New York City Transit from 2010 to 2013 before becoming the president of the agency that year. He retired two years later. And then the interesting part about New York is there's so many tunnels underground that were built years past that, you know, you have to realize as you're going through that there are other tunnels down there that you have to avoid. So you're going above and below and it's, it's, it's really, uh, that modern marvel kind of thing of engineering it's it's just very complex but um i look at our engineering team up in new york and i just say my goodness how did you how do you all figure this out during bianco's time the second avenue subway expansion the most high profile new york city transit project in decades was in the works while first proposed in the 1920s it didn't materialize until the early 2000s the full project is planned as a 16-station, 13.7-kilometer line running from Harlem all the way to Hanover Square in the southern tip of Manhattan. To make it more manageable cost-wise, it was split into four phases. Phase 1 was completed and opened in January 2017 and runs through the Upper East Side. Phase 2 is slated to run through Harlem. The third and fourth phases will cover Lower Manhattan. Phase 1 was, by itself, the biggest expansion of the subway system in 50 years. The full project? Yeah, that's expected to cost $16.8 billion, or $2.6 billion, per mile. That's almost three times more than the cost of San Francisco's Central Subway, and three times the cost of the Purple Line in Los Angeles. The Transit Costs Project at New York University compiled a database of 900 rapid rail projects across nearly 60 countries and found the 2nd Avenue subway to be the most expensive subway project in the world. There are some who argue that New York's density makes this pricey subway a better value per person. The impact it has on a massive population makes it worth it. When you're looking at a population like New York where you, you, know, you have 8 million people in the city, uh, imagine imagine what a day in New York would look like without the mass transit system. How would people be able to move around the streets even with transit? Even on a day when you're moving six million people on the subway, it doesn't look any different on topside. I mean, the number of cars on any of the uh, any of the avenues in Manhattan are still very complex, still you know, still congested. Uh, and so just imagine what would happen if, if transit wasn't there. 560,000 riders are expected to be served by the full four-phase build-out. Phase 1's cost per rider was $26,000, almost a quarter of the Los Angeles Metro's Purple Line extension. It is also comparable to the per-rider cost for the planned $39 billion Grand Paris Express in France. 
Unfortunately, the cost to rider ratio more than doubles for the $7.7 billion second phase of the project through Harlem, which is also one of the most crowded neighborhoods in the city and one that has long desperately needed better public transportation options. New York's public transit system is mostly run by the Metropolitan Transit Authority, or MTA. It's the largest such agency in America. It serves a population of 15.3 million people across a 5,000 square mile area. That includes New York City, Long Island, southeastern New York, and parts of Connecticut. Ridership accounts for 40% of all public transit trips in the entire United States. We ran 8,000 trains a day, 5,500 buses on the road a day, and on our best days uh, during my tenure, uh, we were actually hitting six million, hitting that that bogey of six million customers on the on the subway, in in many many different days. More trips are taken on the MTA subway system than on all of the other 14 top heavy rail systems in the U.S. combined. It is also likely the world's largest system in terms of cost. Most of MTA's $54.8 billion capital plan for 2020 to 2024 goes to subways. Smaller shares go to commuter rail projects and buses. The rest goes to bridges and tunnels, among other things. As late as May 2023, ridership continued to sit well below pre-pandemic levels and all-time highs of the mid-20th century. From 1975 to 2019, just before the pandemic, ridership had increased by 76%. Though other American projects may cost a lot less per mile than the Second Avenue subway, when measured by the number of people served per dollar spent, they look quite expensive. The Sound Transit's Linwood Link in the greater Seattle, Washington area costs about $50,000 per rider. Los Angeles Metro's Purple Line Extension Section 1 costs about $83,000 per rider. Researchers were worried high construction costs will make voters skittish about supporting public transit in all but the densest areas in America. As we see the cost per rider numbers increase, it just makes individual projects look, look less attractive. Even American projects cheaper than New York's on a per-mile basis are eye-watering compared with transit rail in Copenhagen and Paris and Madrid. The Transit Costs Project found the U.S. is the sixth most expensive country to build a rail system, though that stat is deceiving. The five countries ahead of it have rail systems that are far more heavily dependent on tunneling, which dramatically raises costs. A 2021 report from the Eno Center for Transportation found the United States spends $1.3 billion per mile on projects that are mostly tunneled, like subways. New York does skew that average considerably. Without it, the average drops to $582 million. Still, that is higher than Japan, Germany, Mexico, Chile, and several other countries, many of which are developed economies with similar challenges, such as high labor costs and dense cities. According to that data, America is not always the most expensive place to build. However, many at-grade or ground-level projects in the U.S. cost about as much as tunneled projects in other countries. Even without New York City, American rail projects above ground are 48% more expensive than the average, and tunneled ones, 57%. There are several reasons why U.S. subways cost so much. For one, the planning and funding process is slow. If you look across America, there's all kinds of worthy projects in, in different towns, different cities. New York, of course, being the biggest, but, you know, you, you wind up in these, these arguments. If you live upstate in New York, you don't want to be funding, you know, New York City projects. Think of all these competing kind of arguments. You've got, you know, lawyers get involved, and you know you've you've got to deal with all the the court cases that come out of wanting to start a project like Seven, Second Avenue. There are a lot of issues just pulling together the needed funds. In many other parts of the world, a federal entity will simply pay for a project up front or guarantee money. In the case of a lot of American projects, money tends to come in phases, sporadically. Just take the example of the latest announcement by Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg. Phase two of the Second Avenue subway was among them. The total grant, $500 million. The total cost of this phase is about $7.7 .7 billion. I think the local share is supposed to be 
three to four billion dollars. And it's not clear where that money's coming from. And I think the federal government, very understandably, is is skeptical that the MTA is going to be able to raise that money. And so it doesn't want to write the big check until that's 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 there. So you're reaching out to the federal government for a match, right? You're you're reaching out to the state for the basic funding. You're you're always in that mode. And that's why I say, you know, each each four or five year period when you're going after the capital program, it's so important to make sure that you have the projects that people really want and need. The United States also doesn't build as much transit as other countries. When a major capital project comes along, which is only about every 15 to 20 years, there just isn't as much practice or institutional knowledge. In other parts of the world, in parts of Western Asia and, and, um, and in, in Europe, um, where they're routinely building a lot of projects, they have people on staff, they have the expertise, there's a, a, a familiarity that comes with these, with these projects that we seem to have to reinvent here in the United States time and time again. Um, other, pro other places in, in Europe will just pull off um, uh, standards and um, designs from other metropolitan areas and plop them into there, saving a whole lot of time, saving a whole lot of money. But here in the United States, we, we customize things. We customize stations, we customize um, trains, we customize the interiors of trains. But a lot of the problems stem from the construction process itself. There are always unforeseen issues below ground. When you open up a street in New York City, um, all of the infrastructure is is below ground. It's, you know, so, you know, all the sewers and electrical venting system for different tunnels, it's all below ground. So all of that needs to be moved uh, in order for a project to even begin. Controlled explosions underground, also known as blasting, are needed to dig out tunnels. Phase 1's three stations used two different escalator contractors, and each had a different number of exits, elevators, and other features. The ratio of station costs to tunneling costs on the subway was far higher than on other projects in Paris and Milan. A reason why projects are so overbuilt? Politics. When big projects do come around, the political bodies with seats on transit agency boards often want to tack on streetscape improvements, parks, or other neighborhood beautification. These agencies often have to know how to bargain with local governments who have jurisdiction over the areas where they want to build. And the transit agencies often don't have much leverage in negotiations. So what that means is that cities will say, oh, well, if you want a permit to, you know, do construction in our city, you need to, like, give us all these things. You need to repave our streets. You need to use these types of pipes. You need to, you know, build us a park, so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, in New York, we had that problem with 2nd Avenue subway phase one. And the MTA can't forcefully push back on the mayor and say, you know, pound dirt. Like, we need the permit from you in order to, like, legally do this. So then we're going to have to, like, you know, pay the bribe, essentially. Politics also slows down planning processes. Seattle's public transit projects, like the $12 billion to $15 billion West Seattle and Ballard Link extensions, allow for a lot of meddling by local officials over things like where tracks and stations are located. The transit board, feeling heat from constituents, often delays the planning process to allow for alternatives to be explored. But the longer the project is delayed, the higher the cost, simply because of inflation. Labor costs are also higher, but not necessarily because of higher pay. Sweden is a high-wage country, yet its overall labor costs are lower. Projects in the Northeast U.S. employ many more workers, many with jobs that don't always seem essential. There are more blue-collar workers and more white-collar ones, 40 to 60 percent more in the case of a project in Boston. Most sectors in the economy has increasing, increasing productivity over time. Construction is flat or actually slightly falling. And we go back all the way to 1960 and up until today, that's, that's actually 60 plus years we have data for. And we can see that uh, efficiency is not increasing in the construction sector. That's a real problem. And anything where you cannot or do not increase the efficiency is going to be expensive. The other big piece of it is that in, in America and in New York, there's a big overtime culture, right? So collecting overtime on your pay, whereas in other parts of the world, there are caps on how much overtime you can work. And there's also an effort to sort of normalize that stuff. So it's sort of like, okay, you can't just collect, you know, 80 hours of overtime uh, in a week or whatever it is. It's like you can only do, you can only work a total of 45 hours, let's say, I think is, is the cap in, in, in France. 
The relationships between agencies and contractors are often adversarial and secretive, and agencies often have trouble managing contractors. A lack of competition among contractors and privatized risk all inflate bid prices. A lot of the rest of the cost comes down to soft costs, which include things like design, insurance, construction management, planning, and all other expenses. In a lot of places, these costs can range from 5 to 10 percent of the total. For the 2nd Avenue subway, they were 21 percent. Transit can be extremely valuable for a city's economy. In New York, 85% of the people who travel into the business district below 61st Street take some form of public transportation. Highways and roads can't match transit in terms of efficient use of space. You can fit many more people in a subway car than on a highway in separate vehicles. It's also much worse for the environment. Transit projects are inherently more complex than highway projects. There are trains, tracks, signaling and communication systems, stations, and so on. Opting for standard designs reduces complexity, which then reduces costs. You don't have to make something from scratch every time. You can work off a basic model. Um, but if you go to other countries, you see stations are much more austere in a lot of cases, right? They're, they're really utilitarian, and these are just places to get somebody from from one place to another and serve the system pretty well. Here we tend to make them a little bit bigger, a little bit more grand, even the more mundane ones. Standardizing designs and practices also reduces micromanagement and political meddling, simply because there are fewer decisions to make. Researchers like Goldwyn say more of the work ought to be brought in-house, and those agencies need to be empowered to do their jobs. We would say, we still need the consultants, we just need a little bit less of them, and we need leadership at agencies that sort of is on top of the project rather than being guided by the consultants. Regulations, often well-intentioned or understandable, can become onerous or further drive up costs. For example, a lot of areas prohibit construction during certain hours. In some cases, this is because equipment makes noise, but sometimes noise can be mitigated. The beeping sound a truck makes when it backs up can be silenced in favor of a flagger on hand to warn traffic or pedestrians. Labor costs can be cut by tackling America's overstaffing problem and overtime culture. We're not advocating for cutting anyone's wages. Maybe be mindful about overtime, try to spread it out uh, more equitably. Uh, and then the other side of it, right, like, don't just like throw bodies on jobs that, you know, it's not adding or making things more productive. Finding a way out of the chaotic process of planning and securing funding is crucial. Every moment wasted is more money lost. <laughs>